we're so heady in uh, in our own culture that we grasp, uh, you know, quite uh, unconsciously anything or everything that the teachings of the Buddha, the tradition, the Vinaya, the the Theravada, the teachings of the various teachers, and this grasping is uh, is the really the the cause of suffering. You know, like the ignorance of vicha is the if as long as there's a vicha, then there's going to be grasping of some sort. <clears throat> so upadana is the Pali word for attachment or grasping out of ignorance. So that's to be emphasized too. Sometimes we think we shouldn't grasp anything ever or cling to anything because uh, it, it will be the cause of suffering. But notice that the emphasis is this association of avicca and then uh, out of that blindness, uh, not understanding uh, things as they really are, then we grasp according to our habits. So uh, explore this, you know, in your, in, during this retreat, this, even the teach about the sound of science, grasping the idea of it, and then trying to make it into something, uh, you know, or dismiss it, or whatever is, uh, is just trying to conceive it, or, or grasp it, or make more of it, add something more to it. So, the like awareness that allows us to to uh, recognize this grasping tendency, and so it's not a matter of of deciding you're not going to cling to anything, but the clinging that we do when when you're suffering from trying to hang on to the sound of silence. What are you doing? You know that you're that the cause of suffering is is that uh, you know what are you grasping? or holding, or trying to get. And also, each moment, this moment, the here and now, is an enlightened moment. So, even if, even if you begin to just recognize sound of silence, wonderful. Rejoice in that, rather than feel you've got to hang on to the sound of silence in order to get rid of your ego or things like this, the way we can hold to theories or views about trying to purify ourselves or get rid of the defilement. So then meditation becomes more of a joyous celebration rather than a a kind of dutiful performance of trying to always be doing something, trying to attain achieve or or get rid of bad thoughts or egotism or pride and fear and so forth. And, uh, with this uh, sound of silence trying to, you know, decide what it is, this desire to know, I right? Exactly, what is it? Uh, you know, the, the thinking mind wants to to make something of it, wants it uh, to be some kind of thing that we uh, that we can define or evaluate in some way. So, being awake and aware, you can notice its desire to to figure it out, to have a theory or some view about it, rather than to trust in the simple uh, imminent act of attention. So 
during this retreat, you know, just recognize how you how you hold this retreat, you know, the way of trying to get something from it or achieve something or attain something or get rid of something. How grinding it can be when meditation becomes a duty and something we should be doing. And these are way, these are things to investigate in how you you hold the the attitude of uh, meditation and winter's retreat. Now, not that these are even wrong, but but to recognize the grasping of this, the way we we attach to the theories that we create around it, the ideas or ideals that we hold about it, and uh, trying to to attain and achieve uh, these these kind of attitudes. One can reflect upon this compulsive. Meditation, we can do it very compulsively. Now that the sitting practice can become a uh, kind of compulsive for us. Remember years ago people used to ask, how many hours a day do you sit? You know, how many hours can you sit? And uh, I think the more you sit, the better you are. And somebody can sit for 24 hours a day, must be an arahant. <laughs> but Lung Pao Chao used to say, well, you know, if arahant were just dependent on sitting, then uh, hens would be arahant. Now I found the the uh, the uh, the attitude say of attention awareness and is this that of resting and relaxing with it this is uh, rejoicing in it and kind of of really appreciating just some very simple thing of just bringing opening yourself to the present being receptive and open to the present. Where so much of uh, people teach, and, and I'm also guilty of this, of teaching, you know, focusing on the breath and getting, uh, you know, uh, you know, trying to attain samadhi and, and all the techniques that we can use. Uh, how do we hold those techniques? So, we're just teaching or saying things in a certain way, uh, it can just uh, reproduce these uh, compulsive tendencies that we have. Like uh, from my own background, just a, a very uh, goal-oriented society that where achievement is highly praised, and this idea of of being impure, idea that I'm impure and and I need to uh, get rid of these impurities are so kind of ingrained in the kind of mental in my in the mindset of my cultural conditioning so it's easy to just operate on that level of just you know hard work really getting down to it getting somewhere achieving <coughs> It comes very easy for me because that's how I'm conditioned to see life and to react to to life in general. Like in my last year of graduate school, forty years ago, the <laughs> the uh, I remember just, uh, you know, I had lost interest in studying. I no longer had any interest in, in getting my master's degree. And uh, so I, you know, I just, uh, where before I really loved uh, university life and, uh, loved to study and, and was quite, uh, committed to it. 
And but then the last year, something in me just died in regards to to pursuing that any further. So I had to use tremendous willpower the last year because I was so near. You know, I decided I would finish off, get the degree, uh, and then I would uh, do something else. So the last year was just uh, an incredible willful year of uh, forcing myself to do something I no longer was interested in doing. <clears throat> and so when I finished that year and they, they gave me the degree, then I I uh, I was in a kind of stressed state. I couldn't hardly read anything, you know, just the idea of reading anything was so revolting. Uh, and to try to concentrate my mind on anything, you know, I I uh, volunteered for the Peace Corps, then I had to, you know, fill out forms, and and then we had to go through a training period where we had to read things, and I just couldn't couldn't concentrate anymore. It's like something that was broken. Then, uh, and because of that, then I, I tell you, I've told you many times about this recurrent dream I used to have in the first few years of monastic life, where I'd be uh, have, entering a, like a coffee shop and I'd order something like coffee and something sweet and and then the voice would say you shouldn't be here you should be studying for the exam and, uh, and so this would take a various different you know it wasn't always the same but the theme was exactly the same every time and so you know here I was a very dedicated new monk trying to really you know do everything right uh, practice hard, keep the vinaya, and do everything properly, according to the way we were taught uh, with Lung Po Cha. And and I was quite really dedicated. I had this will to to force myself to do all these things. Uh, and so I kept thinking, there's something I'm not done yet. You know, I've got I've got to do something more. So I tried even harder. You know, to sit longer and and sleep less, and eat little, and not to talk to anybody, and all the things we were supposed to, you know, good monks are supposed to do. And, and then, uh, but then I still have the dream. I'd be going into another cafe, ordering a cup of coffee, then a nice kind of chocolate eclair, oozing out with custard, creamy custard. And then this Jackal voice would say, you shouldn't be doing this. You're wasting your time. You should be studying for the exam. <laughs> and so I realized that through much of my life, this was like, uh, I always felt guilty about enjoying things. <clears throat> because you start school when you're very young. And, and then, uh, this pressure is always that, that enjoyment, or just you're wasting your time if you're relaxing, enjoying something, uh, and and because you should be applying yourself to your studies, you've got to learn more, you've got to work harder. So this was, uh, uh, you know, I found in 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 during my um, uh, I was in the military for four years, and it wasn't so bad then because it seemed to be a period where <laughs> where uh, the pressure wasn't so so strong to to achieve, but uh, get back in the in the school system, in the university system, then this this whole thing uh, jumped back into consciousness. Then entering a monastery, of course, this same mindset would would be motivating me. So it's kind of pressure of feeling that I've got to do something more. I'm not good enough. I've got to prove myself. There's an exam ahead and I'm not ready for it. And I'm going to fail. This fear of failure. 
So I kept contemplating this this dream, and then uh, one time I had this dream, and I woke up and I understood. Then I had the insight. The insight was there wasn't any examination. <laughs> But my whole life had been lived with this illusion that there's an examination waiting for me that I'm not ready for yet. <laughs> that I'll fail, I might fail. <clears throat> so I've never had the dream again. I guess that was, I, you know, I got the point, uh, just by seeing that, that the illusion that I carried, the kind of, uh, zeitgeist of my life was uh, there's something I've got to get that I don't have. And I've got to get rid of what I have because it's it's not good enough. And uh, I need to and then, then you can idealize the bhikkhu. You know, this bhikkhu that is always present and mindful and does everything perfectly moves mindfully on all the four postures, eats mindfully, doesn't talk very much. And when he talks, he only talks profound Dhamma, speaks only Dhamma, and uh, is composed, and no matter what's happening, he is completely centered and unaffected by anything that's happening, and uh, eats only a little, never you know, gets greedy for anything, uh, and uh, is content with the four requisites, simple robes, simple shelter, and so forth. So then the realities of my own uh, self would be reflected in this ideal. And think, oh, there's a, I'm not near that kind of history. I don't know if I'll ever make it. You know, to try to to be that good and that perfect. And and so the tendency to compare the realities of my feelings and thoughts and emotions with with the with the impeccable uh idyllic image of the uh, Buddhist monk, of course I could only feel I've got a lot more work to do. I've really got to, you know, you know, discipline myself. I've got to really discipline myself and come to grips with things and not give in to weakness and and conquer these temptations and on and on like this. So then you you kind of dry up into a kind of I felt many times that I like the monastic life was making in me into a kind of humorless, dried-up old stick. You know, there is no spontaneity or fun in it. It was just hard work trying to live up to such a high ideal. And then because also, you know, the sense of humor dropped away and so it became, you know, dead serious all the time. And so life was a pretty dreary plane of, of uh, holding to such images and and even when putting forth enormous amounts of effort to live up to such ideals, never feeling, you know, there was something missing. This, it was a kind of deadening re- experience. Kind of like you know, just shutting off your senses, your mind, and kind of trying to die. So it was a feeling of death that I, that, that enlightenment is, is, uh, you've got to let everything die. And so, just holding to these ideas, they all seemed like, you know, you're getting these ideals from the scriptures and from the teacher and everyone else, and then, and then how I interpret, how I held these, these ideals were, was, uh, you know, of course affected by my own cultural background. 
because there's a uh, kind of Westerner you're know, brought up to think of yourself as a sinner, as your basic identity is that you're born in sin and you and you need to do something to be worthy of God's love. You've got to justify, you've got to prove that you're worthy of God's love. And that's the kind of mindset that comes through being brought up in the West, and especially in the Christian uh, family. But then, because of the practice of uh, of awareness, and the, like this Tamajaka Sutta that we chanted this evening, then this also, you know, I keep reflecting on this, that suffering, it causes cessation in the way of non-suffering. So, I noticed uh, that, that, that monastic life was making me suffer, at least I thought it was, that this, you know, that, that this form, this, this, uh, tradition, um, and all this, these ideals and that, it's just like an ongoing grind of, of trying to perfect something. It never seemed, you never seem to get near it. And so, it's just, uh, Contemplating more and more, uh, what am I grasping that makes my life so dreary and joyless? And so then I could see, you know, I began to sense this sense of this uh, upadana I had towards my own views, the way I interpreted Dhamma Vinaya, the way I uh, regarded tradition, uh, the way I, my, my feelings that I had to do something, I had to achieve, I had to prove myself in some way. <clears throat> and that these were, it became apparent, I was more investigated, as I was more willing to investigate as I, I saw how I this was an attachment I had to ideas and views. It seemed right, you know, in the context of of my own cultural background, this uh, this uh, attaining thing, this trying to purify, this this uh, this was highly praised in in the in my own uh, cultural conditioning. So. One had to find a place beyond the cultural conditioning. I couldn't work from my own cultural conditioning with the Dhamma without getting it distorted. So trying to interpret Buddhism from a basically Christian conditioned mind and the Christian conditioning wasn't the more kind of mystical Christianity, it was the kind of, you know, very dualistic, heaven, hell, reward and punishment type of teaching that, that, that I'd heard, that I'd accumulated from my, uh, childhood. So then contemplating it even more, what is the place where there's no culture conditioning? You know, because you acquire that after you're born. You know, you're not, you're, you, you don't come out being born as an American. You know, you don't think of yourself. It took me years to realize, you know, as a child, my sister, two years older, used to, when she started school, and she'd come back and she'd say, uh, we live in Seattle, Washington, and and Seattle is a city, Washington is a state, and it's in the in America. And I get it all mixed up, you know. Never <laughs> <laughs> and so she would be teaching me, but I didn't quite understand what Seattle and a city or 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 state and a, and a nation were, you know that. 
I, but then, you know, when I started school, all these things fell into place, and everybody, this was the, what you were taught, and it was the real world for us. The, so the culture, obviously, identity of being a, an American, can, you know, was, was created through education. The identity with the, with the body. You know, I remember my sister and I, we used to take baths together. And, and we really had fun in the bathtub. <laughs> a lot of fun to take a bath with my sister. And then, then she, being two years older, got to the age where she wouldn't take a bath with me anymore. And I was very upset. I remember. <laughs> I couldn't figure out why. You know, I didn't, the difference between the sexes didn't, you know, even though I was aware, it didn't register as being anything, you know. It, it didn't have any cultural connotation. You know, there was no sense of being male or female. That came later. You know, identity. Then the, because she, you know, no longer wanted to, to take bath with me, is, uh, we found out later because girls shouldn't take baths with boys. And this, the boys, uh, you know, and you become aware that you're a boy as a very conscious identity, where before that it didn't seem to have, have any significance, difference between boys and girls. So that was a condition, isn't it, identity after birth. You know, you're born with being a, either a male or female. You, you don't identify with it. You don't have a sense of it being what you are. So then, where is the, the, where is it right now, what is it right now where that you can, they, like the Zen koan, what was your original faith before you were born? I used to like that one. This, this koan, you know. What was my original faith before I was born? And of course, uh, try to figure it out with the, with the, with our very highly conditioned mind already, you know, my original faith, uh, and faith meant this faith, and, you know, take it quite literally, or trying to figure it out symbolically. But then through the awareness, and through being, re- recognizing this sound of silence, I uh, suddenly it dawned on me that when I stay in this silent place, then uh, it's like it it embraces uh, it, it. It's not culturally conditioned. It's not a you know. It's not something I've acquired through uh, through schooling or education. It's a natural. It's na- it's natural. It is what it is. Now, how I culturally relate to it is something else. Is it a buzz in the air? Is it tinnitus? Is it, uh, is it, um, you know, just the sound of your nerves uh, in your ears? Is it this or that? And, and then, then, of course, if you're, you know, if you're brought up as a Buddhist, a Mahayana Buddhist, you say it's the sound of Avalokiteshvara. Or it's, the pure Brahman, or it's the, it's the, uh, the, the Sufis, you know, the voice of God. But, uh, you know, those, those are cultural ways of, of, of relating to it. And even in the, uh, people interpret, in the beginning was the word, and and then if you in the beginning was the sound of silence <laughs> where the words come from so so just re- reflecting on this more and more and, and experimenting you know, I, I could sustain it I could kind of rest in it and kind of float in this this uh, sound seeming sound or vibration. And then, because it it's it sustains itself, it's not something I create. You know, I don't. It's not like a 
and nimitta that I create. Uh, so it, it, it's, you know, it's always present. It's just my ability to, to recognize it or to be with it, it varies. But as I trust it more and more, then, then there's a sense of pure presence. There's a attention, is an awakened, I'm awake, there's intelligence. It's not a, a dull trance. You know, you're in a kind of dopey state, and and uh, that it doesn't make you dopey and you're kind of lost in in uh, just um, mental dullness. It's, as you rest in it, it's it's clear, bright, and there's and there's no sense of being anything, of being a person or or a uh, Male or or anything like that, in no sense of being uh, Ajahn Sumato. And they, these things come and go, but this always is the constant factor. So uh, through this perspective, then I could begin to see the attachments I had to my ideals. You know, like uh, you've got, you've got to practice, you've got to get, achieve, you've got to get rid of, you've got to purify. Suddenly I recognize in, in this stillness as I, as I learn to trust it more and more, then I could see the, these compulsions that, that I create, these, these compulsive habits that uh, arise and cease. And when you see them no longer from, uh, you know, when you see them in perspective like that, they lose their power. They're no longer, you know, the taken in inter- uh, you know, intimidating or, or that which uh, takes you over. That makes you feel guilty or makes you very compulsive or obsessed. Or a feeling of worthlessness or failure or or whatever is is reflected in this. You can you watch the reflection, like in a mirror, isn't it? The, the mirror is will have reflections in it that come and go and change, but the mirror is the constant factor. What comes in front of the mirror then you know is reflected in it. So it, if it's beautiful, it have a beautiful reflection. If it's Hideous, it's a hideous reflection, but it doesn't stain or harm or destroy the mirror at all. That's not. The mirror remains pure, no matter even if it's reflecting dirt, feces, or horror. So, so this is, this using this, this uh, simile of the mirror, <coughs> And to me, it's like this sound of silence is is a mirror for the reflections that come into consciousness, and that depends on conditions. You know what? You know the the weather, the the state of mind. Whether you're feeling tired, <clears throat> or you're feeling alive, or you're feeling frustrated, or angry, or feeling bored or rebellious or whatever, the reflections come and go. But that which remains unstained, unsullied, unaffected uh, by the reflections that, that come and go in the mirror. Then I began to notice also that as I, you know, began, I thought, when I first recognized this, realized I became very enthusiastic. But then after a while, it gets rather boring because emotionally, I can see I'm boredom arises uh, because emotionally, I'm my habits are 
to seek extremity. You know, to go from one extreme to the other. So the emotional habits that you develop from childhood are are arranged around that, on being happy or miserable. You know, you don't notice when there's neither, when you're neither happy nor miserable. You just, you feel alive when you're happy. So happiness is a goal that is, uh, you know, great, greatly thought after. To be continually happy, interested, excited, fulfilled, successful. To have a really happy, joyful, wonderful life filled with interesting friends and exciting events and adventures and romances and and pleasure and beauty and a constant uh, re, uh, relentless one pleasurable thing after another happiness just goes on and on and on but it doesn't <laughs> as you all know by now that happiness is very dependent on many other conditions so it's it's uh, trying to just seek happiness you become addicted isn't it you become a an addict a sukha addict <clears throat> so you know they're like a drug addict or uh, that's what they're doing they're just trying to seek happiness <laughs> <clears throat> So, and, and everyone else is too, most of them are. They're trying to, to, uh, find happiness as the goal. And so we do have happiness. We experience it, but then we cling to the memory of it. You know, we, we think of, you know, that when we don't have it, then we want it. And then I find out, even when I am happy, then by wanting to hold on to it and be happy even more, I become unhappy, become desperate. And as I create even more problems, about even when I'm happy, I create unhappiness by trying to hold on to happiness. So then in the Noble Truths, the Buddha uh, used the suffering dukkha, which is unhappiness. Suffering, and that is the Noble Truth. Because, as I say, my life was very much aimed at trying to, you know, like happiness, interesting things to do. I'm feeling I have a purpose, I have a meaning, I'm somebody worthwhile, I, I can... Uh, be a success. I be. I have many friends, and I'm liked, and I'm respected, and appreciated, and admired. And uh, I, I can, you know, life an interesting life. I always wanted to have an interesting life. I thought my parents' life was so utterly uninteresting. that I determined when I was quite young I wasn't going to live like they did. It was so boring. So, so I did, I did, you know, I sought a lot of adventure. I, li- I still like adventures. I'm going to Mount Kyle. <laughs> uh, I still like interesting life. Uh, but uh, And the, actually, this monastic life is a very interesting life. <laughs> been very interesting in my life actually but the but yet at times it's very boring you know it's dreary you know the because of course you 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 have restraint and things like this you can't just follow impulses and 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 do what you particularly feel like doing every time but the so that you can get you can resent that and be caught in negative, doubting states of mind in regard to monastic life. I think it's a waste of time or it's just repressing your emotions and it's a wet blanket 
the kind of heavy trip celibacy is really boring and things like that. <laughs> so you can make a good case for this life <laughs> as being a really dreary plane. Oh, namo nasa langam vato. When you're mine, you need someone who likes to listen to opera, Italian opera, and he'd like to have one more kind of grand, kind of operatic style, and then you've got this, uh, oh, that's uh, <laughs> so then they then, but then recognize that the 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 message is to wake up not to get addicted to you know uh, great uh, performances and exciting sense experiences and and you know fascinating interesting things to be doing but to awaken. Because, you know, a life just spent on that kind of indulgence, of just sensory indulgence, is boring after a while. It, you know, too much pleasure, too much fun, becomes really boring. Uh, you, you can't, you can only take so much, and then it, then it, then it is no longer fun anymore, no longer interesting. So the awaken because then it becomes habitual, and when things become habitual, they become they're perfunctory, and and they go into a kind of dreary plateau. So recognize that this awaken day is the is the whole teaching, really. So using this, I use this sound of silence. It's just where, you know, when I'm with it, I'm, there's a, it's awake, I'm awake. There's this awakeness, alertness. And this is just how I experience it. That's all I can tell you, but, you know, from my own experience. But, uh, the, this, this, I, even when I'm feeling miserable, uh, and, you know, physically or, or emotionally, I can refer to this, Stillness, this still point, this sound of silence. And then if I learn to, to sustain this stay, rest in this, then I, then I can bear the, the kind of emotional, um, misery or the physical discomfort. Because it stops me from clinging to it. You know, you know, I'm not trying to get rid of it or blame it on somebody else or or suppress it. I can I can bear emotional misery and physical discomfort and pain. But what I can't bear is when I attach to it and want it to be otherwise. You know, then I create this sense of I can't stand this, and I get caught in it. I can't bear this. I can't stand this anymore. It's too much. Then, then I create that, isn't it? That has nothing to do with the kind of mood or the, the kind of emotional state that, that lingers around in, in consciousness or the physical pain or discomfort. I'm creating that, so it becomes complicated, compounded with my own desire, attachment to to not have it, to get rid of the pain, to get rid of the depression, to get rid of the despair. So learning to trust in this, this stillness, then of course, the, it, as you, you, be, uh, you know, you, the, the challenge is to begin to not just Realize it when you're sitting still in the temple, everything's quiet, but in, 
in just the movement and flow of life. And so, even when I'm eating or or brushing my teeth or or putting on the robes or you know, you can do it with with yoga or tai chi or whatever. There's always this, or with uh, waiting in queues or riding on the London Underground, or whatever, you can, you know, as you become more, begin to detect it, recognize it. You, it's, it's all the time, everywhere. It's expand, it's limitless, it has no limits, it's infinite. And as you begin to break out of the perception of it being a sound, which is, tends to be an, from the ears. See, it comes from here. It's a, you realize it's a kind of an open heart, uh, a receptivity to the universe that we're living in, that we're experiencing through this body and its senses. It's a, a, it's a very skillful way of, of just exposing the, my personality in all its various permutations. So the subtle forms of clinging and identity that, that I have as a, as a Buddhist monk, as a abbot, as a arjan, and as a, member of this community, all the kind of subtleties of attachment and opinion and view uh, uh, on a personal level are reflected in the mirror. So the challenge is to take, be the mirror rather than the reflection. To be the, the stillness rather than being the things that move in the stillness. How do you do that? <laughs> so then only words like faith or trust. You know, words take you that, that far. And then it's learning to, to trust in it. Not in your idea about it. But the imminent act, the kind of Surrender, letting go of this opening, and letting even the fears uh, that you that come up, or the all the clinging, holding patterns that we that we're so uh, intimidated and so used to, so identified with, uh, are reflected more and more. The subtleties of attachment are seen. And it's not a matter of judging those, or, but of just accepting them. What, as long as it remains in the mirror, fine. We're not asking, the mirror's not asking to, that, you know, the mirror doesn't have a, a view about it. It doesn't say to something ugly and hideous, oh, get out of my reflective abilities. I am, I'm a mirror that only will allow beauty to manifest. I only want to reflect beauty. Mirrors don't care. They don't reflect anything. <laughs> they don't care at all what comes in front of them. Also see that as a simile for uh, this awareness and consciousness. It doesn't matter anymore what arises in consciousness. You know, it's no, whether it's marvelous or stupid or beautiful or ugly. It doesn't, it's, that's not the issue anymore, is it? It's not, not, uh, choosing and preferring and controlling, but accepting, opening and letting things flow through, through your awareness, through consciousness that is our great ability as human beings incarnated in these human forms and in which we can learn and and 
realize the, the deathless, recognize it. So in the Third Noble Truth, which is Dukkha Niroda, the, the advice is to, re, is realization. The Jika Dante is that you should realize. So this word, English word realize, is, is not, is you don't create anything, it's re, reality is now, isn't it? Reality is right now. Unless you, you, you have a view about reality that you create. <laughs> and that's not reality. You have, that's an opinion or some theory you have about reality. But, so, so realization or recognition right now is like this. Non-judgmental. Not passing judgment on what is the reflection that is present now. It is like this. And therefore the, it's, it's, uh, you let it be what it is. You don't have to go around trying to make it better or trying to get rid of it if it's, if it's nasty. That's not, if, you know, the, the pure awareness accepts whatever is not judging. Doesn't really care. You know, it doesn't even care what arises. <laughs> Not making a problem about any of it. If we learn to be the mirror rather than the reflection, or be the awareness rather than the person trying to be aware. So as long as you're trying to be somebody who is aware, you're grasping the idea only. You know, you. We've got to be aware. We've got to, uh, you know. And even if you grasp my grasp my words, you know, you, Ajahn Sumedho says, and then you, you've got to use the sound of silence, relax into it, and something will happen. I hope. And then you can say, well, you know, he's probably different than I am. He doesn't have all the, you, you know. We all assume we're, you know, somebody in my position. You can. Project that I'm perfect, you know, that, that I don't suffer anymore, and that I just, uh, you know, am just so mindful and joyful. Uh, he, you know, he's such a joyful man, you know, as if, you know, that was all I experienced day and night was just joy and bliss. But, <laughs> because you, you know, you, you, you would like to think of it, if this guy spent 35 years doing it, I hope, you know, it pays off in some way. <laughs> I want him to be living proof that it, that it works. So, so people, you know, make, you know, expect a lot from me, actually. But these are projections, too, you know. What you think I am is what you create, isn't it? You know, what your perceptions of me is what you create. It's not, you know, it's how you perceive your, your own way of, of, uh, and the associations you have with the perception of Ajahn Sumedho is uh, something you create. That's not me. And the same applies to you. All your perceptions, views, and opinions about yourself are not you. They're your creations that you make, you know, that you you attach to, and you believe are yourself. But when you're no longer holding to the reflections, then then there's no self. The real realization of anatta. And so the various things that you believe are yourself, they'll come and go, just like anything else. This, this, uh, vipaka kama, you know, this, the result of being born, uh, is that you get old. So the vipaka kama of this moment for me is rather getting old. An old man, old body. So it's, uh, 
That's the vipaka of being born. If I'd never been born, I wouldn't be 68 years old. Would I? <laughs> but, you know, my reincarnation, you know, because I made a mistake, obviously, got born again, and I have to go through the, through the whole process of going up and getting old. And so this is a result. This is just a, a kind of a cheeky reflection on just the, uh, the you know, the the comp vipaka kama. Like having this body the way it is is the result of birth. And this and and then the so and, and the way I've lived my life according to you know, if I'd been an alcoholic or done all kinds of things that would uh you know, be very harmful, then I'd probably look much worse than I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I might be dead already, you know, died at fifty. But the uh, but the vipaka kama is like this. Then, then the vipaka kama say uh, celibacy is what you know. So, so active sex life, you have vipaka kama. You have memories of it. Of, uh, because sexuality is a very strong, uh, experience. You know, one of the great pleasures, sensual experiences of, of this realm. But it leaves strong memories in the mind. So I noticed like after 35, 36 years of celibacy, I have nothing to remember around <laughs> And the previous, <laughs> previous, uh, uh, life that I lived, is, you know, doesn't, it, it used to, I used to remember things a lot, <laughs> but now those memories are kind of worn out, so they just don't arise really. And so the result of celibacy is like this, and so I have a lot of peacefulness, a sense of peace a lot, because I, Sexuality is very exciting, you know, very stimulating, exciting kind of uh, experience. And those perceptions are very exciting. So the celibacy isn't exciting. People don't be celibate for excitement. (laughs) But also, because it isn't exciting, also the the kind of vipaka kama is like this. You have a peaceful consciousness. You don't have that the kind of ir- a lot of that irritation and excitation that we that I would have if I hadn't been celibate all these many years. Well, that's the, what, how I reflect on the on vipaka of celibacy. Or being a, a Buddhist monk, uh, you know, of, of uh, living in, under the Vinaya and uh, the um, the restraint and the the style of the Buddhist monk, the vipaka of this. And of course, sometimes one's held the Buddhist monastic life in a in an unskillful way, so it becomes personal. So then the vipaka tends to be. You know, a lot of guilt, anxiety, uh, and, and feelings of not being pure enough if one is grasping at it from ideals, like trying to be this perfect bhikkhu, you know, always present, always, you know, everything, every movement, uh, every moment is completely in full awareness and non-attachment is the ideal. So then the, then holding that ideal leads to this sense of not being that good. You know, I need to work harder. I need to be more mindful. I'm going to be more mindful than I am. And then so you get caught up in these, in these very good ideas about being more mindful. 
But the attachment to those ideas, the vipaka, is a sense of despair and and la- and and it takes you over. You blind yourself by trying to become and live up to some high standard. So in in this uh, way of reflecting and being the the purity, the original faith the stillness, the awakenness of this moment and trusting it without identifying or making anything out of it. As soon as you make something out of it, then you're back into the the old pattern of, of attachment out of ignorance. So this is a, a way you can only know for yourself. You know, it's the, this this, you know, I can't, no one can do it for you. And the, this awakenness is, is, you know, something you can, uh, you know, you learn to, just, it's such a simple thing. It's nothing, it's not like getting jhanas or anything. It's just very simple attention, open, relaxed receptivity. It's not asking you to to attain some state before you can really be mindful and really do the satipatthana and vipassana. That kind of advice tends to reinforce this whole sense of I've got to get this samadhi before I can really do vipassana and things like this. It reinforces the whole the whole sense of I'm somebody who's got to get something I don't have in order to be able to do the practice that I'm supposed to do to be free from all suffering. So that's another creation of the mind, isn't it? That's another scenario that you might be very attached to. But if you trust in the awareness, then then you, you, you don't need to become anything or get anything. It's nothing, there's nothing lacking. Nothing you have to do really. It's not even a matter of doing it, of, you know, trying to do it, but of just being this, to recognize, to realize. This is a very natural way to be. It's not, not a, a high attainment. So then, maybe that's the original face before you <laughs> but it is you know when you when you begin to appreciate then you you can see you know the cultural uh you can get behind the cultural uh, conditioning or your family conditioning you know the way you were the how you were uh conditioned by your mother and father you get it it before that happened. So I offer this as a reflection for this evening.